So welcome to the Jewish Teen Funders Network and Jewish Book Council webinar, The Gratitude Diaries, a book club webinar where we can discuss the main themes of Janice Kaplan's book, The Gratitude Diaries, and how this can affect our work with teens. I'm Danielle Siegel, JTFN's Program Manager, and I'm excited to introduce you to our speakers today, Janice Kaplan and Suzanne Swift. Janice has enjoyed wide success as a magazine editor, television producer, writer, and journalist. The former editor-in-chief of Parade Magazine, she is the author or co-author of 13 books, including the New York Times bestseller, I'll See You Again, and The Gratitude Diaries. She lives in New York City and Kent, Connecticut. So welcome, Janice. Thank you. Suzanne is the director of the Jewish Book Council Network, an organization dedicated to promoting the reading, writing, publishing, and distribution of quality Jewish content books in English. Prior to this role, Suzanne was the program director at Valley of the Sun JCC and the director of adult service and cultural arts for seven years. She has recently completed a double master's degree in Jewish education and Jewish studies. So welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sure you'll all welcome, um, join me in welcoming our speakers today. So without further ado, I will hand over to Janice to get us started. Wonderful. Thanks, Danielle. And uh, Suzanne, it's so nice to be here with you. I so admire what uh, the Jewish Book Council does. And Danielle, now that I know about what your organization does, it, uh, it's also really terrific. Um, and it's exciting to get to talk about gratitude to all of you, because the work that you do in connecting gratitude and generosity and teens is really really very extraordinary to me. And um, I, just, I just admire it. And however I can help and add to the great work you do is, is really my honor and, and privilege. Um, one of the great pleasures of writing about gratitude is that it's something that we all kind of get, right? We all understand kind of implicitly uh, the need for more gratitude in our lives and the need for helping teens and, 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 and others incorporate gratitude into their lives too. I started this book by doing a big national survey on gratitude. And one of the findings, as some of you who read the book already know, one of the, the findings was that something like 95% of the people we surveyed said that they thought grateful people were happier. And we had the same number of people saying that they had reasons to be grateful or that they had friends and family who they were grateful for. But then when we asked people about whether they expressed gratitude, the number really plunged. And all of a sudden we were at like under half, you know, 45, 49% saying they expressed gratitude. And that's really what, where what you do comes in so dramatically because you're teaching people to express gratitude. Uh, in different ways and to put their lives in perspective. And one of the things that I've tried to do over and over again is to make people realize how expressing gratitude does change their lives. It changes their relationships. It changes their attitudes towards their spouses or partners. It changes their sense of how they are at work. And for parents and kids, um, it can have a really dramatic effect on changing, uh, changing the dynamic within a family also. So um, that's sort of the brief, the brief overview of what I do, and um, I'm delighted to, uh, to have the conversation with Suzanne and, and all of you um, about bringing more gratitude into, into your lives and into your work and making it a part of every day. Janice, I'm so happy to be able to spend this with you. I got to know you a little bit the last time you came to visit us in Scottsdale when I was there last. And I am just, if I had to show you my book, it would be all underlined. I have every chapter has pages underlined, so I, I can't go into everything. But let's talk a little bit about a year of gratitude, a whole year, specifically thinking about that. Can you give us some of the highlights and why you said I needed to do this for a whole year? Well, first of all, it was such a great pleasure to do that. You know, as Danielle mentioned at the beginning, this is my 13th book, my bat mitzvah book. And um, it's really also my favorite book. And we're not supposed to have favorites as writers, but this really, <laughs> this really is my favorite book. And it's because, as you just said, I got to spend a year doing nothing except thinking about gratitude every single day and writing about gratitude every single day. And um, I did, the, the, the format of the book, again, as those of you who've read it know, is that each month I did something different. And I, I thought about what, how can gratitude change our lives? Where are the places that we 
want things to be different and can change things. So, for example, the first month I was grateful to my husband. Um, and that had just such a very dramatic effect on our relationship. You know, and I always joke that I had planned to be grateful to my husband for that one month. It seemed like it would be enough. Um, but it was so important to both of us that we not only continue that for the year, but we have continued it ever since. Um, so uh, getting to, to write about that, getting to think about that was really pretty, pretty extraordinary. Um, so how has your Jewish background had helped you with some of this gratitude? I know we all learn about tzedakah and giving. And so were there any points that said, oh, yeah, my Jewish background does help, does make up help with this? Um, great question. I, I think gratitude is very much part of any religion. And actually in the book, as you know, I did not talk about religion. And it was a very conscious decision not to do that. Um, because I think that I, I wanted the book to appeal to people, however it is uh, that, they're, that they're approaching gratitude. But certainly gratitude is crucial. Uh, to Judaism and is very central to Judaism. That every time you say a prayer, uh, you say a blessing in Judaism, you're expressing gratitude. Um, it, you know, look at the, the blessings that we do, whether it's over a, a piece of bread or, or the first time you see sunshine or, or you know, just every time we're together, um, we, we say a blessing of thanks. And, and so that ability in Judaism to stop and recognize things, um, sometimes, you know, kids or others feel like, why are we saying all these prayers? Why do we have to have all these blessings? Um, but it really adds something enormously to our lives because if you can do it and not just make it rote, but actually do it as something that you're stopping and thinking about. So, you know, when you're saying you're blessing over your challah on Friday night, actually stop and think how terrific and amazing it is that you have this gorgeous challah in front of you. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, my, my own children um, uh, always remember that every Friday night before we lit the candles when they were growing up, um, we used to, I used to always say, first thing we do is talk about something good that happened this week. And that became part of Shabbat uh, for us. And it can, my kids are grown up now and it continues to be part of Shabbat for them that they do that. And I think it is very much in keeping with what the religion and the meaning of Shabbat is. Because what is Shabbat if not stopping to be grateful, if not stopping to appreciate? And, you know, it's supposed to be a, a, a moment in the week that you take out of time. How about if it's a moment in the week that you also take out of complaining and that you use for, 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 for looking at good and happiness and, and grateful events? I love that. I love that. Um, well, talking about children and going to your kids as, as teens. And um, I think one of the things I thought was one of the most powerful, one of the most powerful lines, although there were a lot of them, is to raise grateful kids. You need to be grateful for your kids. And could you talk a little bit about that? I just think that that was just an interesting way to look at your children and looking at raising our children and working with children too. It goes all the way around. It's a full circle. Right. Well, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to help our kids, right, and trying to improve our kids and correct our kids, and we should do that. Um, I, I, I don't think otherwise, but kids also, especially when they're teenagers, they want to know that they're appreciated. They want to know that the good things that they're doing are seen as well as the problems that they have. And, you know, I often joke about how we do this with both our spouses and we're, our kids that we give them what we call constructive criticism and we hear constructive and they hear criticism. <laughs> and if, if all your kids think they're going to get from you is negativity and something that you want to change about them or something that you can help with them, they're not going to want to talk to you. Um, my own younger son uh, who, who lives in Chicago and I'm in New York, um, and, and he calls me practically every day now. And, and I so appreciate that. And, I, and it's, it's gone on for some time. And I said to him uh, once, you know, Matt, you're so wonderful to, to call me all the time. And, and it really means a lot. And I know how busy you are. And, and thank you for doing that. And he said, Mom, every time I call, you tell me how wonderful I am. Why wouldn't I call? <laughs> and, and, I love it. I, I think it's kind of an important lesson because I often hear parents talking about how their, you know, adult kids never call them or, or you know, and I always want to say, well, are you the parent who, or, or the person who, when the kid calls, says it's about time you called because <laughs> I don't, I don't want to call and hear and hear that either. Um, just one other thing about 
teenager, Suzanne, when I was writing the book, I heard over and over again from parents of teenagers as I was writing it, and they would come up to me and they would say, I can't wait to read your book because I have the most ungrateful teenager. <laughs> and somebody else would say, no, I have the most ungrateful teenager. And it seemed like it was a competition for the most ungrateful teenagers. And I think teenagers aren't actually ungrateful. I don't think we're raising a generation of ingrates. I think that we need to introduce our children to a broader world. And again, I think that what your network here is doing that's so important is indeed taking kids and teenagers out of their, the bubbles and the shells that they live in and, and letting them see something bigger and something, and something different. Um, I often give the example that, <clears throat> excuse me, around the holidays, uh, the, you know, back at the December holidays, I used to always, with my kids, um, you know, all of the, uh, the requests for, for donations that you get, I used to always uh, put those in a big basket instead of throwing them out. And I would sit down with my kids at some point, and, you know, mom and dad get to set the budget, but the kids get to pick what the donations would be to. And I like doing that because it would raise so many discussions with them about the various uh, places that, that were asking for money. And I thought of that because of course, that's what your entire uh, network is doing. You're taking that on a grander scale and you're giving children that two, two great gifts. You're letting them one, see what the problems are out there and to realize that they're in a position where they are not struggling in that same way. And number two, to realize that they can help. And I think that's a really extraordinary gift to give kids and certainly takes them out of that feeling of ingratitude because it puts them, it, it gives them a bigger view of the world. Oh, I totally love that idea of taking all those letters and emails and putting them in one place and then having a family go through that. What a great right. idea. Right. I know one of the things you talked about in your book um, was writing five checks and then deciding where those checks should go. And you want to talk a little bit more about that too? It kind of goes with what the basket you were talking about of all the um, things that came in. But I love that idea. Yeah. Well, I think that um, very much we all have a, uh, a somewhat skewed idea of money, right? And a skewed idea of how much we need and how much we have. And we're always looking at the people who have more rather than the people who have less. And being able to put m money and finance in some perspective is really, it's hard for adults. So what can we think of for teenagers um, also have that, 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 that same struggle? And um, with, my, with my husband and myself, it used to be that every year, you know, doing taxes or discussing finances was, was always a, a big issue. And, uh, I, you know, my husband used to joke and, and he would say, you'd go through, he would say, well, how much do you want to have? And my answer would always be, well, just more. <laughs> you know, whatever we had, it wasn't enough, it needed to be more. And I, I, I'm at the opposite position now. Now I just look at what I have and I feel so grateful and so blessed and so eager to be able to help others with that. And I think it goes in both directions. I think the uh, recognizing that makes you want to help other people. We've certainly found in a lot of research studies that, that we did that gratitude makes people more generous. And I think it works the other way too. If you find a way to get people to be generous, uh, again, as you're doing with, with your teenagers in this network, then they'll feel more grateful because they realize that they can do something for others and that they can help others. And, and that makes a huge difference. So the other one question I wanted that I thought was really important that you talked about in your book, it wasn't a different chapter than the, the money one, is the idea of people always wanting something, going with what you just say. And they want it, they want it, they want it, they just have to have it. And I remember my kids saying, they just have to have this. And then when they get it, it wears off like a shiny penny in a little bit of time. And so we see that with our kids, with our teens, and even within ourselves. You know, we always want what we can't have, or we always get it, and then we don't want it. And so how can we reverse that whole, that whole idea? and turning it into a gratitude idea. Well, that's, that's exactly right. And um, as I talk about in the book, psychologists call it habituation, which means basically that you just get used to stuff. And we all have this, these, this idea that something materialistic is going to change our lives, right? We think if we have the bigger house, the bigger boat, the fancier car, whatever it may be, we want something and, and we have a sense that that's going to be important. And what happens over and over again is that you get that 
And then after a while, you just stop noticing it. You know, look around your own house. Uh, think about the things that meant so much to you at some point to get. And do you still even notice them? Um, sometimes you do. You know, I, uh, I, I, I try to look at the art in my house uh, every morning and, and appreciate that. But, but as a general rule, things fade into the background. And one of the great um, uh, findings is that experiences don't fade in the same way that stuff does. And it, it, it makes sense because stuff you get used to, right? You, you have something and you see it every day and, and then you just want something else to replace it because you're bored with it. Um, if you take a fabulous trip, uh, you know, I just, I just came, my husband and I just had a big anniversary and we celebrated in South Africa and we just got back a couple of weeks ago. And may I tell you that even in the two weeks we've been home, that trip keeps getting better and better. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there, I know, it's amazing. Right? And that trip will continue to get better. Um, and the findings by the psychologists who have looked at this is that uh, that's true for a couple of reasons. One reason that experiences work better than stuff is that you don't compare experiences in the same way you do. The, the things that you have. So teenagers may look at each other and somebody has the fancier phone or somebody has the fancier computer. And so if I only have the one she had, it would make me feel better. But if you get back from that trip, you've had an experience and it doesn't really matter what somebody else's experience was. You still get to talk about that experience and there's no way to really compare those experiences. And so they're, that's, they're very important in that way. And they also become a part of your life. They do, as I joke, they, they not only get better, but they stay with you and they become a part of who you are. Whereas I don't think any car, computer, or iPhone actually becomes a part of your identity or who you are. So again, another gift I think we give uh, kids is to give them experiences and to let them experience things um, with us and on their own uh, that, uh, that can be meaningful to them. And I just want to ask one last question, then we'll open it up to lots of other questions is, now that you've toured this book and you've gone at, what is the most surprising thing that you've heard, you've experienced since this book has been out this year? Um, well, um, Suzanne, thanks to you, I have done an enormous <laughs> number of, of talks around the country and in Canada on the book. And it has been enormously gratifying um, how people have responded to it. And I, I think one of the things I found was that in, in this book, I was writing about making my life going from good to better. And I've spoken to so many people in so many places now who've gone through really terrible times or had really difficult situations, whether financial or health or actually loss of a loved one, um, other tragedies. And they've talked to me about how gratitude helped them get through. And I'm always very moved by that to realize how people in difficult situations can, can make the most of it and can, can find gratitude. And I'm also a little bit in awe of that, um, of people who are able to, to look for the good constantly. Uh, but it also reminds me of one other thing, which is that why can't we do that when things are going well, right? You don't want gratitude to be in the rearview mirror. You don't want to be looking back and saying, wow, something terrible just happened. I'm going to be grateful for that. I wish I could have realized five years ago how good things were. Um, and, and I think that's something uh, we, we need to remember. My, my own son, um, who has learned not to complain because he knows I don't allow it, <laughs> um, but he's in a very high pressure, very, very high pressure job. And he had one of those in finance and he had one of those jobs where, you know, he wasn't, got no sleep last weekend. And we were talking on the phone and I said to him, Matt, I know it's been a really tough weekend. And I said, if you can get any perspective on it, think about how you're going to feel at this time next year. You know, you're going to be looking back on your job and this big deal that you're doing. You're not going to remember this particular weekend that you didn't sleep, but you're going to re remember what a cool deal this is that you're dealing with. And you're going to remember what, you know, an exciting adventure that was. So try to have a little bit of that perspective while you're living through it. Now, it's really hard to do, um, but I think it is something that we can all try to do for ourselves to, to, to stop and think, you know, boy, how am I going to feel about this next year? Or am I going to look back on this in five years and, and hopefully remember the good stuff, not the bad stuff? Maybe I can do that right now. So before I turn it over, I have one more thing that just struck Sorry. a thing that I remember real quick is one of the things you told me when I last spoke, when you last spoke to a group I was at about writing about three things every day. And mm -hmm. can you just touch on it and then we can read that right into it, talking to everybody asking questions. Sure. Well, you know, 
getting a gratitude diet, a gratitude habit started is really important. Um, and you can know that you should be grateful, but what do you actually do to make it happen? And so um, one of the simplest things is to just write down three things every day that, that make you happy. Or if that's too much, start with one thing. You know, I, I, I sometimes tell people, keep one scrap of paper next to your bed, write down one thing every night that, make, that you were grateful for that day. And you know, all of you listening now, you can do that. <laughs> you, can, you can start tomorrow, try it for a week, see what happens, one thing every day. And, and, and the reason that one little thing works is this, um, you'll wake up tomorrow morning and you'll have your first cup of coffee at whatever time it is and you'll go, love this cup of coffee, grateful for that, gonna write down that tonight. Okay, you're done for the day now with being grateful, but that's okay because you've started your day off being grateful. Or it gets to be the end of the day and you haven't been grateful for anything and you remember that you have that piece of paper, you're gonna have to write something down that night. And so you stop and you look around and you're, you're grateful for the kids who are sitting around you, or you're grateful for the sunshine, or you're grateful for the friend who's, who's, who's next to you. And again, you're able to turn something around. So Suzanne, you're right, having that particular um, gratitude habit that you start, uh, that you make yourself do, and gratitude shouldn't be a chore. You know, if writing something down after that first week, if it becomes a chore, or if writing three things down is too much, that's why I say write down one. Um, but we do need reminders. We do need reminders because otherwise we slip back. And so giving yourself that little something that turns it into a habit uh, really is, is a su successful way to start. Danielle, now I'm sorry. I just added that one thing, but I'm turning it over to you. Right? <laughs> no, wonderful. Thank you so much for getting us started. And that we have a lot to mull over and a lot to think about. And one of the great things about this book is it really does make you think. Um, and it makes you change your mindset, which is really amazing. Um, so we're going to open it out to the floor, to our book group who is here with us. Um, so if you have a question or a comment or something that you'd like to pose to the group, um, you can um, indicate in the chat box if you're on um, a computer um, that you have something to say and to share. Um, and then we can unmute you or you can unmute yourself. Um, if you're joining us by phone, uh, you can press star six and that mutes and unmutes you. Um, so while um, people are kind of mulling over everything that um, they've heard and, um, you know, thinking back to the book, um, there's someone I wanted to call on. Um, she's calling in by phone, which is Trish. Um, she just mentioned to me recently that she, that she read the book and that she was uh, really struck by a lot of the themes um, in it. Um, so Trish, I would love to hear um, your point of view as someone who works with teams in a Jewish teen philanthropy program. Um, kind of what, what were your takeaways from this book? Because you were really excited about it when I spoke to you. <laughs> yes, um, thank you so much, Danielle. You guys can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Okay, cool, cool, thanks. Um, yeah, so I really did uh, enjoy reading the book. I um, actually, as like part of the process of reading it, decided to start like to start writing down my gratitude things and things like that, um, because I really think that this is like a mindset that um, is is really needed and um, can sometimes easily be kind of like lost, especially when you're an, an educator and sometimes like inundated with so many different things going on around you. Um, something with working with teens. So there was the, there was a chapter um, where specifically uh, there was a focus on, you know, teens and, and working with your children and kind of how to express that gratitude and a little bit of depth is to, is to maybe why there's um, some sort of disconnect with uh, teens really showing a lot of gratitude um, and that there's like this separation between, um, you know, them not really being so driven by accomplishments and being judged in that way that they're, they're losing this sense of self. Um, and I see that all the time when I'm working in these groups and with teens because um, those, these are the conversations that I'm having with them where they're saying like, you know, 
I have to accomplish X, Y, and Z. I, I'm really not really sure what's underneath those, those moments. And so I was just talking to Danielle about how I'm trying to figure out different ways to maybe bring this into educational process. Um, and, you know, and I work specifically in teen philanthropy, so um, I, I, what that means is that these teens are, um, you know, going through a, a process of learning about philanthropy and actually creating their own um, grants and giving them out into the community. And, and, like, so they're dealing with something that's really amazing, which is, you know, collecting money, working really hard for it, and then giving to give it out, which is something in the money chapter that was also talked about that I thought was really exciting um, and how, you know, you, you gain a better intrinsic value actually giving your money away. And then also though, for them to be kind of grateful for the place that they are in within the program um, and to help them maybe see the humanity and what it is that they're doing. You know, these teens are setting goals. They may not necessarily meet their goals. And, and if they don't, what does that mean um, in terms of who they are and what they're able to accomplish? and really still feeling that really gratifying um, sense for them. So I'm just thinking wildly, you know, what are these different exercises or moments or things that I can have them do? Is it something where I've done an activity before um, where I, I've had a group of teens think about them uh, themselves and somebody they're really grateful for in their life and then have to actually write a letter to that person and then uh, you, kind of surprise them and make them like call whomever that person is in that moment and read the letter. And then you talk about those feelings and stuff. And I've, I've done exercises like that that are really impactful, but I'm also now trying to think of like, what are smaller ways that I can incorporate um, senses of gratitude to help them really see themselves um, and to see their peers. That's great. Can I, can I ask Trisha a question? Um, uh, what are some of the changes that you see in the teens that you work with uh, in, in the course of the program? Are, are you aware of them changing their attitude and seeing the world differently and becoming more grateful? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of them um, definitely understanding where they are in respect to the rest of the world. You know, I, I think um, what, what kind of stood out to me and connecting it to my teens was talking in the book about realizing your income, you know, and then, and then your income compared to like the rest of the world, that they're kind of getting to understand that comparison. It's making them more compassionate. Um, I think that, you know, within the group, something uh, that's added is doing um, what like we call kind of like shout outs, where are these little like, you know, everybody goes around the circle and says one thing that they're they're grateful for, or thankful for about other people in the group. Um, and it makes them really have to kind of see the humanity in each other a little bit better. So those are some of the shifts that that I've seen. And and the implementation has been like fairly new because I've only really um you know been that inspired after getting into this book. Well, I think your um, idea of having people write a letter of gratitude is a wonderful one. As, as you know from the book, um, there's been a lot of research on that, finding that it's really extremely powerful. And um, uh, it's been, this isn't necessarily relevant to your teens, but it actually is very powerful in reducing depression. Um, and one of the reasons it reduces depression is probably the same reason that it works for teenagers, is that it, it reminds people that they're worthy that there was somebody there for whom they to whom they should be grateful because somebody was nice to them and you know i think especially as teenagers get caught into that attitude of nobody understands me nobody gets me and i'm all alone in the world as teenagers sometimes feel to be able to write a letter of gratitude uh to somebody and thank them for something that they have done in some way that they have helped them um i think really means a lot and there are probably lots of simple ways that you can do that with. Yes, you're, the big idea of writing the letter and calling somebody up and discussing the feelings is, is really valuable and, and, uh, and probably irreplaceable, but um, they can also do it on a simpler, on a simpler level and just you know um, jot something off a little more quickly uh, to somebody just as a way to remind themselves that there are so many people out there in the world who are helping them and who are trying to help them. And um, 
you know, I think that uh, uh, kids, kids just need that reminder. Amazing. Thank you so much um, for sharing, um, Trish, kind of the, the impact that it, that it has had on you. Um, I know um, that uh, Alana um, has a um, quick question that she wanted to ask. Um, so, Alana. It's... Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, well, first, before I delve into the question, I just want to say um, I really enjoyed reading your book. It was actually the first book I read of this year, and so it was like a really great um, way to kick off and start the year um, and about thinking about being grateful. And uh, just one of the things that you talked about in the book was how, you know, almost like how you would start to make a game of it in reframing your situations, like how can I make this situation that's kind of not so great. How can I be grateful for it anyway? Um, you know, and you talked about the weather and, and different things. Um, you know, even if it was a rainy day, you were grateful because you had a, an umbrella. So I mean, it's just, um, so I found myself in on days when I was feeling badly or um, nervous about something or uh, just a little bit down to like try to stop myself and, and say, you know, how am I going to reframe the situation to feel grateful? So that was definitely a nice way to like kick off the year. Um, but as far as my question, I wanted to dig in a little bit about, um, because the programs that we work with, uh, with the teens, um, a lot of them are pluralistic programs where you have teens coming from lots of different backgrounds. Um, and there's lots of different opinions and differences of opinions. And I know throughout the book, um, when it came to gratitude, you had certain friends that you came across and certain people that you would speak to that just really couldn't wrap their heads around it, that couldn't get in the mindset. And, um, and I know that, you know, when it comes to difference of opinion, that definitely plays a part in some of these groups. Um, and I guess my question is, how did you continue to have the patience um, for people um, coming from a different point of view and to be grateful for them? Mm -hmm. Um, it's hard <laughs> sometimes when somebody is doesn't get the whole gratitude and you hear them being in, um, not grateful about things that seem so irrelevant, um, it becomes difficult. I think using that reframing that you talked about initially is a great technique and maybe it's something that you can try within your groups when people are having a difficult time about something, ask them to try to reframe it ask them to try to put it in a positive perspective. Um, and if they say, there's no way I can do that, well, of course there is, there, there, there always is, or somebody else can, can help them to do that. And I think that's a great exercise for people to do, to see, uh, to, to just let's turn something around. I'll tell you a quick story. I was coming back from Chicago um, a month or so, a month or two ago, after giving a talk and, um, uh, it was a snowy night in New York, and it was a late flight that I was taking, and the plane couldn't land in New York. And we circled New York for a while because of the snow, and then we got diverted to Washington, landed in Washington, and we were in Washington for sitting on the runway for a couple of hours, and they finally decided they weren't going to be able to take back off, bring us into the airport. Uh, they're going to give us uh, vouchers for that night to stay over in Washington. The plane's going to take off again at 11 o'clock the next morning. And so we're in this line of 300 people because another plane had also landed in Washington. And the man behind me was standing in line, griping about how terrible this was and why hadn't they figured out how to land in Kennedy and at least they could do is bring us out cookies. And he was going <laughs> on and on and on. And I turned around and turned away from him and I must have sort of rolled my eyes and the man in front of me looked at me and he saw me do that. And this had been right, it was, right after there was that shooting in the airport in Florida. And the man looked at me and he sort of quietly said, you know, um, they actually don't have to give us vouchers at all for a hotel when it's, uh, uh, when it's weather related. So I think we're kind of lucky about that. And after what just happened at that horrible shooting, I think we should all just be kind of happy that we're here and safe and, and inside and warm. And I really smiled to myself and I and continued to talk to him, of course, for the next hour and a half that we were standing in line. Um, but it struck me that here were two people in exactly the same situation, right? The man behind me 
who could only see something terrible, that he wasn't being getting, getting cookies and the airline had done everything wrong. And the man in front of me who could say, it's weather and they're doing everything they can and boy, we're, we're here and we're safe and we're lucky. And, and I thought about that because I thought, who's gonna be happier thinking about this situation tomorrow, right? You know, when you're gri griping about things all the time and you're unhappy about them, it never makes you feel better. And that's an important lesson for your kids to realize also that if they can find that way um, to turn something around and to find the good in it, um, it doesn't make the bad go away. It, you know, it doesn't get you to your destination any faster if you had to be in New York that night. Uh, but it reminds you that sometimes there are things you can do. And when there are things you can do in a situation, you should do them. Um, but if there's not anything you can do, maybe, maybe it then becomes about you rather than the situation. Um, and I think sometimes, a lot of times, uh, uh, teenagers and, and adults also, I hear this often when I'm giving talks, I'm often asked the question where somebody will say, well, my friends say that I'm negative, but I think I'm being realistic and they're just not being realistic. <laughs> and um, it, it's interesting that we often think that being negative and seeing the bad side is somehow more sophisticated or more realistic. And it's not. <laughs> and that's a great thing to be able to help your kids lose also. That, you know, teens sometimes also have that sense of uh, uh, being negative about everything and finding the bad stuff in it makes them just sound cooler. Um, if you can help them turn that around and help them see how they're helping themselves and everybody else by finding a positive solution, that the world moves better when we look for positive solutions then I think maybe you can help them all get together better and, and do better as a team. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Andrea, um, I believe you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just really wanted to um, <clears throat> endorse this whole notion of being grateful. Um, in addition to my work in youth philanthropy, I run a Jewish sleepaway camp. And when I started running the camp, the biggest problem I had with my staff would be meetings at night. And there was such a negative vibe that I inherited. And when I would say something to compliment a staff and recognize something that they had done, they took it as very disingenuous because they hadn't received that before. And after brainstorming with my staff, we started um, thank yous at the beginning of all of our meetings. And it didn't just come from the supervisors. We decided to ask people to recognize something special that they had seen done by their peers during the day. And for people to call out their peers for the littlest things that they saw as positive absolutely changed the community for the better. And it has become, um, at some points like we have to shut it off at night because it goes on too long. Because people are looking for the good in others now. And after reading the book, I realized I can take this into the cabins at night and make this a part of the bedtime ritual. And creating some type of gratitude journal for each child to be able to take home at the end of their session at camp, I think will be um, just a really positive gift. So I wanna thank you for that because you really got me thinking. And it, it really affects the whole community and the vibe of the whole community when you approach things from an attitude of being grateful as opposed to being critical. What a great story. Thank you for sharing that about the camp. And I, I think you are absolutely right that having people thank each other uh, for things big and small makes such a difference. And they're actually uh, good for you for having discovered that and, and incorporated it in your camp. And, there are a number of companies that I've spoken to that are now doing that, including um, Facebook and Google and um, Southwest Airlines and Kaiser Permanente, the, the, the health company. Um, they actually have um, people whose 
basic job is to figure out how to make people in the company grateful to each other and express gratitude. Because one of the things that is so often missing in a work environment is any sense of gratitude. And it really changes how people feel about where they are and where they work. And you're also 100% correct that it doesn't necessarily in any way have to come from the top. And if anything, people appreciate it more when they're getting it from a colleague. My own publisher had, has heard me talk about this too many times. And so they, um, they did something one day where you could give a lemon tart uh, to somebody in, your, in the office who you appreciated. Uh, they, I don't know if they had some you know, online way of thanking somebody and then the person was given a lemon tart by the company for being appreciated. And um, I just love that idea. You know, it's, it's so small, but it's so cute. And who doesn't want a lemon tart? And I actually ended up writing, writing a piece about that. Um, so just finding those little things and those little ways that people can express appreciation to each other. Um, and to have your, your kids at camp keep some kind of gratitude journal, I think is also wonderful because again, Kids, teens, like the rest of us, like adults, tend to focus on the negative. And I, I often say, you know, if 10 great things happen in a day and one bad thing happens, which is the one we remember, which is the one we talk about? And I'm sure that happens with your campers. They have this fabulous, wonderful day, and then one little thing happens, and that's what they write home or email home, whatever kids do now, to mom and dad about, right? So it would really help. If you could, you're not dismissing the bad thing that happened. Of course, it was a problem and, and uh, somebody can help them with it and recognize it. But it would also be nice if they got to write down the three great things that happened that day and they can remember how much fun they had, you know, the swimming or how great lunch was or, or, or whatever, whatever it was. And, and that gives them a different way to think about their experience. So instead of focusing on the negative, it helps them to, to focus on the positive. And and I think some of the suggestions you're giving could probably work in some of the uh, teen philanthropy groups that um, that you all have also as a way of of uh, helping the teens there to to find the positive and to find the positive in each other. Yeah, even finding the positive in the conflict resolution Good. is a way that kids can really have perspective, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's really. I, I think gratitude gives kids and people perspective and appreciation. So I like what you write about. So thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. When you were saying about the conflict resolution, I'm sure we all watched the Oscars the other night and, you know, saw that, uh, uh, big event at the end. And I thought it was actually kind of cute when Jimmy Kimmel came out and not knowing what to say. And he, and he said, you know, he said, well, it's only an awards show. And it was, uh, it was such a, you know, it was, it was obviously not a planned line, but in some ways it was correct. And it was, it, um, you know, here you have this night where everything is so important and so crucial and who's going to win is so crucial. And then he came out and he said, it's only an awards show. And um, uh, it, it's a good thing to think about in times of conflict or conflict resolution, as you're saying in your, in your groups, that, what you're doing is really important. It really matters. But let's look at it from another perspective, too, that maybe our friendships with each other really matter and our recognizing each other really matters and our being grateful and appreciative to what the other person is trying to say, uh, that really matters, too. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Andrea, um, for your comments there. Um, I know that some people are joining us by phone, um, so they're not quite able to indicate if they want um, if they want to ask a question or make a comment. So I'm just going to take a beat um, so that if anyone wants to unmute themselves um, and ask a question or a comment, they can do so. Um, so if anyone would like to um, ask a question or make a comment, please go ahead. Okay, not, not quite at the moment, but that's okay. I'll give another opportunity just because I want to make sure that um, everyone um, can have a voice um, if they want to. Um, actually, Janice, I, had a, I have a, a question for you. Um, you, um, you have this great quote in the book, um, 
which says you can show gratitude by giving and giving led to more gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that cycle of what it means to give and to be grateful and then to be grateful so you give more. Mm -hmm. And um, for our teens, um, sometimes that is giving money, like they're fundraising and, and they're giving away that money. Um, and sometimes it's the teens giving their time. Um, if they are in a program that requires of them uh, a four or five hour commitment once a month on a Sunday or extra commitment in the middle um, and in between sessions, um, you know, some of these teams do give up a lot of their time and energies on a program like this. Um, so I would, I would love to hear your thoughts as far as not just giving money, but giving time and how that can be linked um, to gratitude. Well, I think it's absolutely true. I think we also have the, the natural tendency um, to appreciate the things that we are spending time on. Right. And the more time you're spending on something, the more invested you are in it. And we have a natural sort of subconscious way of telling ourselves that what we're doing is right. So if we're spending time on something, it, it must be it must be meaningful. Um, there is a great cycle where gratitude leads to giving and giving leads to gratitude. And um, uh, uh, that's it's 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 true over and over again and it's a very Suzanne had asked me about Jewish concepts before and you know it's a very Jewish concept to say um, you do things right Judaism is a, is a religion of action and uh, you give your time or you decide you're going to donate your money and um, that action changes how you feel about what you're doing and sometimes we, we tend to think of life as being the opposite, right? That we're all so rational, we're going to decide what we want to do, where we want to put our time, and then we'll do that. But the truth is sometimes you just do the action without actually even understanding why. Um, or you get somebody to do something and you say, just trust me, <laughs> let's do this, you know, put in the four hours this week and then see how you feel about it at the end, okay? Mm -hmm. Rather than rationalizing it up front. And um, I think that can make a big difference in how people approach things, that um, action really, action matters. And uh, I do talk about in, in the book, um, actually, I think I quote Henry Timms, who's the head of the 92nd Street Y, and, and there's a really wonderful, uh, both at fundraising and, and uh, being a leader. And um, he, he used the phrase to me that gratitude is an action. And we tend to think of gratitude as being a feeling, right? But it's how I started out. We all think we're grateful. We all think we appreciate things, but it's the expressing the gratitude that makes the difference. And um, gratitude is an action. And uh, we want to remind the kids of that also. So get them to do those actions, whether it's spending the time or donating the money and see how they start to change. Amazing, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to um, uh, pick on someone as well, because I think Celeste, um, you'd mentioned earlier um, about um, the book and how it kind of made you think a little bit differently and, um, and your takeaways from it. So I'd love to hear from you about how you might um, implement um, what you what you read in the book and what your main takeaways were. Oh, Celeste, I'm just going to unmute you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm sorry, I got confused. Do you do star six to mute? Do you do star six to unmute <laughs> and whatever? Um, I just, I really related to the stories in the book and like, I just can't pick one to, to, to gush over, but I just felt like the one where the woman could have had $30,000 and then was hoping for more money because she was jealous about her supervisor getting 30 million. And um, I would love to do a, a more deeper read of the book and maybe take a few of the scenarios or stories that really resonated and talk about how that relates into the team's lives. Um, I also coordinate a Jewish peer leadership program and part of it is about being a mentor and a role model in the Jewish community. And I think not only does it talk about, um, you know, gratitude and giving back, but just to make ourselves better people and sort of change our, um, 
cassette tape in our that I'm dating myself <laughs> um I have a social work background so in terms of like cognitive behavior therapy it's like always I always was taught like it's the cassette tape in your head where it's like play um stop rewind play stop rewind and what are the messages on those tapes and um I just think especially when I work with teens whether it's in the youth philanthropy setting or in the peer leadership program um you know the teens have very different self-talk and I definitely think in terms of perspective that um, the teens can sometimes see something differently. And, you know, I so believe, you know, being at the right place at the right time, but it's not only that, it's like having the right mindset about that. Also the story about the, um, the person that could have had the card that would have led to like a better job. Like I think every day our teens are confronted with these situations, but I think they're also so, um, glued to their phones that they miss these opportunities. And so just by doing like the read, the one read I did, I, I took some notes and trying to create some of these stories as um, examples and then have some sort of reflection questions about um, teens and they think about their own lives and how they can do better or, you know, be more present and really um, taking for granted what they have now. A lot of the teens, I would say, that participate in the program, love the program. They see the, the now factor and, and how, what it does for them. But I feel there's always people that said I should have gotten more involved and do more and trying to see how we can get that energy, not after the program, but what they're in the program and just being more present. Great. You know, um, Celeste, I heard a, a story about a young guy on Wall Street who um, I had gone to his boss to ask for a raise and um, uh, the, the boss said to him, you know, you're making a lot of money now. And the guy said, yeah. And the boss said to him, okay, when you started here a year ago, how much money did you think you would be making? And the kid uh, was just out of college and gave a number. And the boss said to him, how much are you making now? And he said, three times that amount. And so he said, so why are you unhappy? And he said, well, because the guy who sits next to me is making four times that amount. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and, exactly. And, and, and that's the position that I think teens and all of us put ourselves in. We, we don't have an absolute on anything, but we're always comparing ourselves to somebody else and maybe comparing ourselves to the wrong person. Um, and so if we can sort of pause and, and realize that what we have is pretty good, uh, that helps. And I think another thing that's important for teens to realize is that sometimes, sometimes to teens, gratitude can sound kind of sappy, right? And, um, and, and particularly for ambitious and six kids who are very focused on their futures, they worry that if they're grateful for something now, it means they're not going to be able to achieve something in the future. And I think it's really important to point out to them that gratitude plays very nicely with ambition, that they're, they're, they are in the same park, uh, that it's okay to be grateful for what you have now and to still say, but that's what I want, you know, next year I want to have that. And in two years, I want to go there. Um, and actually when you're grateful where you are now, you're more likely to achieve those things in the future because you're happier where you are right now. Mm -hmm. um, People appreciate positive people. They're more likely to want to help you. Uh, they're not going, people don't want to help, as you all know, you know, people who gripe all the time. Um, but if you're, if you're excited about where you are now, but you have an obvious goal for the future as a teenager, that really sets you up better than almost anything else um, for, for being the kind of person who is likely to be successful and who people want to help. And I think it's, uh, that can be really helpful for, for teenagers to realize and for them to put gratitude in, in that perspective. Yeah, also too, it's all about the journey. I think they take the journey for granted and they want to get to the end point now instead of realizing, well, if you, you know, take advantage of your journey that it might get you even farther than you had ever dreamed, but you have to put the work into it. And then something else that stuck out for me is that, you know, when I grew, grew up, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Instagram. So, you know, you're always comparing, but I feel like it's a, a different level now in terms of social media and kids are always constantly comparing, like, you know, whether it's the pictures or where they're at or where they're not at or who are they with or who are they not with. And it's just a different world now. And 
um, you, you gave me a lot to think about, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. And just one quick thing on social media. Um, uh, you can try to use that social media for, of teens for good also, because hopefully teens are smart enough to realize that the things their friends are posting are, um, you know, are the good stuff in their life, right? And that's why, that's why their lives look so great. Well, how about if you ask teens to use social media to post something that they're grateful for? And then they can have a little album of, of, of things that they're grateful for. They don't even have to say that that's what they're doing. Um, but encouraging them to use this, their social media uh, in, in that positive way um, does that same thing, or, or families can do that. You know, the whole family can decide that Tuesday is going to be grateful day on Instagram, and we're all gonna just put up a picture of something we're grateful for today. And um, it ends up being a nice, uh, a nice way to use social media for, for good rather than for pro being a problem. Love that idea. Love that. What, what, a, what a great thought for us um, to end on. So I'm so sorry, but we have run out of time um, for today. I know we might have had a couple of other um, questions and comments floating around. So if you do have any other questions um, for Janice, please feel free to send them to me. And Janice, is that okay if I pass on some, some questions to you? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, Janice and Suzanne, for, for joining us today. Um, and a big thank you to the Jewish Book Council for helping us set this up and, and for putting us in touch with Janice. This was really a, a rare treat and what a great book for us um, to discuss and, and delve into. And, uh, to delve into. So really, thank you so much. Um, look out for more of our, um, our webinars from JTFN. Um, our next webinar is Trends in Jewish Teen Giving interpreting data from the field of Jewish teen philanthropy and um, that's on March the 29th and I hope you can join us for that it'll be a very interesting one um, feel free to check out our website on www.jtfn.org um, you can see an archive of all our webinars and our other upcoming um, uh, events and information and also you can uh, find out more about the Jewish Book Council on their website www.jewishbookcouncil.org so thank you so much everyone and have a wonderful and grateful day <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank bye. you bye bye, -bye.